And what, what this form of music is, it's a way of exploring just a few notes in one melody, but exploring the infinite potential that's possible when you look at those set of notes from all the possible angles. The Hebrew Bible is just like this. And the book of Job is like a jazz quartet that's 11 hours into the session. And by the time you get to Job, you've cycled through the melody hundreds of times. And so when the hostile one steps onto the scene like, you know this character, you've actually encountered this character dozens of times before. How we doing guys? I've got some exciting news to share to you of a discovery of a lost sermon. Over a year ago, Tim Mackey spoke at his home church, Bridgetown in Portland, Oregon, on the book of Job. Uh, it was on suffering. <clears throat> and actually, the sermon ended up being about finding the melody of the Hebrew Bible, and it was one that really spoke to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I took my Bible project pilgrimage that some of you followed along with me, um, I went up and met Tim Mackey and, and brought him a few gifts when I went to the Bible Project Studios, and one of the things that I brought him was a Blue Note uh, jazz vinyl record. Um, and if you've seen this sermon before, you'll recognize why I did that. And after you watch this, you'll definitely see why I got him that. It was a really awesome moment to give that to him. And then months later, I come back home and I'm looking for that sermon everywhere online on YouTube and I can't find it. And this one was like big for me. It was really important and helped me find the melody of the scriptures and to understand them as a whole. Uh, so I started looking and I couldn't find it, couldn't find it on YouTube, couldn't find it in my files anywhere. And I was distraught. I was like, wow, this one was awesome. I don't know why it got taken down or where it was or what happened. But uh, lo and behold, as I'm working on this project that's going to be coming up uh, that I'm teasing right now is uh, um, the Satan, Demons, and the Divine Council. It's a supernatural series that I think you guys are going to absolutely love. I discovered this lost sermon while I was working on it. I found it in my archives and boy was I so glad that I recorded it. And I think you're gonna be so glad that I did too because it's one that definitely needs to be out there for all of us so that we can find the melody <clears throat> of the scriptures and grow closer to Jesus. So uh, I wanna introduce this video but then also set the stage uh, for the supernatural series that we're gonna be putting out on the Satan uh, demons uh, and the divine council. This sermon will really help set the stage uh, for the next four or five videos that I've got lined up to be released over the next few weeks. I think you guys are going to like it. Uh, make sure to subscribe. It really helps us to get the message out. And as always, ring them bells. What he believed the whole of Israel's scriptures we're all about what Christians call the Old Testament, um, Jesus called by a number of different titles, um, and they played a crucial role in Jesus' up, upbringing. He was raised on the stories and the poems of Scripture. They had a deep, formative impact on his imagination and his sense of who he is. You can just, anytime he talks, he's just oozing lines and imagery and vocabulary from his people's Scriptures, that is, uh, the Hebrew Bible. And in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, Jesus summarizes the entirety of the Hebrew Bible up into one sentence. It's really remarkable. I don't know if you've spent any time reflecting on it, but it's right here. Jesus said to his disciples, this, everything that just happened over uh, Good Friday and Easter weekend, this is what I was telling you about while I was still with you. Everything that is written about me in the Torah of Moses in the prophets and in the Psalms, had to be fulfilled. This Jesus is one of Jesus' shorthand descriptions for what we call the Old Testament. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures, and he told them, this is what's written, and he's not quoting here, this is Jesus' summary. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is Jesus' summary of the message of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament includes the book of Job, doesn't it? This is Jesus' summary of the book of Job. 
Right. <laughs> right. Um, how many of you have tried to read the Old Testament before? Yeah, how'd that go for you? How is that going for you? Yeah, you know, you stick with the Psalms, right? Some of them, right? <laughs> Some of them, right? Right? But it's, it's touch and go pretty much everywhere else, you know? Um, really? Okay, that's interesting. Um, you know, whenever I try to read um, the Old Testament, it's really actually hard for me, at least it was for a very long time, for me to see that that's, this is what it's about. Like, really? Um, and really, there's only two options. Um, one option is that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, um, and I suppose that's possible, but I think the odds are a lot higher that um, I just don't know how to read this literature, and that the questions that I bring to it are the questions that may be my questions, but they are not the questions that are going to illuminate what these texts are all about, including the book of Job. So at the risk of insulting your intelligence, I'm going to make it even more simple. Um, here is Jesus' summary. My clicker. Click. There we go. There we go. Um, three steps. It's like it's really simple. The Messiah. You guys with me? Here's Jesus' summary. The Messiah, uh, which is one of many images in, in uh, the Old Testament to describe uh, a, a person whom God has selected and appointed for his purposes in the world, specifically to represent God to people and for, to represent people uh, before God. The Messiah, God's chosen, favored one. You with me? That's step one of Jesus' summary. The Messiah enters into suffering and to death. But then out of death and through the other side, that Messiah is vindicated from suffering and death into resurrection life and into what Jesus says, forgiveness and good news announced to all of the nations. In Jesus' mind, it seems so simple. It's like, yeah, just read it. <laughs> and like, that's what it's about. And uh, for many of us, of course, that's not, that's not our experience. And this is not, this is not an idle question. Um, this is a question that for me, as a, a new follower of Jesus in my early 20s, like I, I really had a difficult time. I was so down for Jesus. He's so, he is, he was and is so compelling and beautiful to me. And, but trying to, and he really cared about the first three quarters of my Bible. It's called the table, of, in the table of Contents, the Old Testament. But when I try and read this thing, it's like really, it's like talking snakes and cosmic floods, lots of sex scandals and violence and ancient poetry. And it's like, what does this have to do with anything? Anybody? Do you know what I'm talking about? So, so this, a normal person would be like, okay, well, I'll, I'll just like deal with the Psalms and read the stories about Jesus and I'll call it good at that. Um, I took the other course of becoming obsessed with it and went um, to school for much longer than any reasonable person should um, uh, and learning lots of ancient languages because I, for, for one reason or another, the way I'm wired, uh, this has become one of the driving questions of my whole life. What is Jesus talking about? I want to know what Jesus saw when he read the book of Job. I want to hear from Job what he heard from Job. Because the book of Job is about a guy who suffers. And somehow how that suffering is woven into the mysterious purpose of God. And I think that's a really important thing to know what Jesus thought about. Because it clearly informed like so much of what he did. I want to hear from Job what Jesus heard from Job. And what Jesus says he heard from Job is this. Are you with me? So let's just, as a thought experiment, let's just think about the story of Job from this summary. And you know what's really fascinating um, is that it works really well. Like really, my clicker, this might be a problem. It's going to be a problem for me. I'll just say next slide for the next one's Corin. Um, you know what's interesting? Um, Job like fits the pattern like to a T. It begins with God's righteous chosen, favored one, blessed, right? Are you with me? I mean, it's actually, remember, the book has a three-part structure. A prologue, dialogues, and epilogue. The prologue is all about highlighting Job's righteousness in his innocence before God. And yet, this righteous one that God calls his servant is handed over to unjust suffering. Near death, huge outcry, of protest and lament 
And after all of that lament is complete, God vindicates his righteous servant, restores his life, and restores him to a place of blessing, and forgives his friends, who, interestingly enough, are from all the surrounding nations. Anybody? Well, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. I think there's something here. Um, I remember distinctly, um, I was riding my bike near 26 and Salmon um, when this hit me one morning. <laughs> I was going to work, and I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, I think I need to rethink everything I ever knew about the book of Job. Um, this is why I, uh, if I made the video today, it would be really different than the one that I made six years ago. Not that it's wrong, but it just wasn't right enough. <clears throat> so let's take this one, um, one step at a time through this, kind of out, through this outline here. Um, so let's take the step one. Uh, Job is identified as God's righteous, blessed, and favored one. Two times uh, in the prologue, to Job, uh, God is called by both the narrator, excuse me, Job is described by both the narrator and by God as righteous, as blameless, as innocent, fearing God, turning away from evil. And notice God calls Job, my servant, my righteous, blameless servant. Now that right there should be a clue to us um, that this is not a story about like how God relates to average people in the world. Um, as good of a day as I can have, and really my wife would be the one to tell the truth here, um, I'm pretty sure um, that this does not describe my actual life. Are you with me? Like maybe some of the time. But uh, the, the whole point, and God says there's no one like him on the planet. Right? He's not a normal guy. This is not a story about why good, bad things happen to good people. There's something else going on here. So God responds um, to this righteous, favored one by blessing him immensely, immensely. The camera shifts up to God's heavenly courtroom, and this mysterious figure um, called uh, the Satan uh, comes to God and begins to spin, spin a web of words that calls Job's character into question. And what... Um, uh, I, I translated it as the opposer or the accuser, my six-year-old six -year -old self, my, six, my past self from six years ago, <laughs> translated it that way. Uh, my favorite translation now is the hostile one. Ask me in five years, it might be different, but I like that one today. The hostile one answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Haven't you put a protective hedge around him and his house? Haven't you blessed the work of his hands? His possessions have increased. Stretch out your hand and strike all that he has and he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said to the hostile one, no way, you can't trick me. I love this guy. I'm going to keep blessing him. The Lord said to the hostile one, look, everything that he has is in your hand. Just don't kill him. So begin the rounds of uh, disasters that happened to Job four times over. And when the hostile one uh, returns, God's very proud of Job's response, which was to continue to bless the Lord. He takes and he gives. We come naked. We go back to death naked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And the Lord said to the hostile one, this is chapter 2, verse 3, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. He still holds his integrity, even though you incited me against him to destroy him undeservedly. Uh, most of our English translations right there read, without reason. And that's not what God means. He doesn't mean without reason. What he means is without just reason. So I, I want you to... Let's pay attention to this. The book is turning up the volume on the fact that Job's suffering is unjust. The narrator says it. The, the logic of the story says it. God says it. Are you tracking with me? It's the focus of the story. And so this is the fork in the road, I think, for a lot of us, is how we respond to this tension in the book. And many of us, this is just one more part of the Bible that's weird, and, you know, I'm down for the Jesus part, and I get the portrait of God that Jesus presents to me, and then I go to the rest of this book, and it's like really confusing, especially this moment right here. 
So um, if I'm going to follow Jesus, does that really mean I need to come to peace with the fact that God might ruin my life to settle a wager with like a rebellious angel? Is that like, do you have to believe that? Are you with me? Is that what it means to like read the Bible and believe what it says and that settles it? Like what, what's going on here? And, and the answer to that question, I think, for each one of us is going to expose deep assumptions that we have about what the Bible is and what the Bible is for. And, and the, the reality is that most of us have been shaped in corners of the Christian tradition where we've been trained from our earliest encounters with the Bible to view it as like a divine reference book. Dropped out of heaven either as like a behavior manual telling you the list of all the things you should or shouldn't do, or like a theology dictionary where when you have your felt needs or questions, what you learn to do is like what page, what chapter, what verse of the Bible do I go to when I have a question about X, Y, or Z? And so if I have a question about the problem of evil and, it's, and how that, you know, uh, resolves with God's love or justice, we'll go to the book of Job and you will get the answer because that's what the Bible's for, right? To give you answers to all of your questions. And then you read the book of Job and you're like, yeah, I don't, I'm not really satisfied with this answer. And it doesn't really seem to square with who Jesus is. What is going on here? I'm just going to go do something else, which is what most of us do, except me, right? <laughs> <laughs> for, better, for better or worse. Um, so I, I think what's happening here is um, something that uh, happened with my sons. I remember when uh, my sons are eight and 10 now. Um, back when um, my older son, Roman, was about four, at least my first memory, of his first real encounter where he saw a hammer. And like he really like, saw the hammer in my tool shed and he like got it out and started doing something with it. And what he started doing with it um, was digging a hole. He saw the claw of the hammer and what in, what in his mind, what it made sense was this, it's like a pick. You know, like a, like a pick. And so um, half of our, we have a very tiny um, backyard, and half of it is a beautiful little situation that my wife Jessica has come up with. And then the other half of it, we've handed over to destruction <laughs> for our boys. And it's just dig pits and, you know, holes in the ground and that kind of thing. Um, and so, and a lot of those holes have been made with my hammer, right? <laughs> and with the claw of my hammer. And so it just made sense to him, like it's a claw. And I was like, I don't know, okay, that's what he wants to do with the hammer. There's, I tried to show him a shovel one time, and he was like, no, the hammer. Right? <laughs> and, uh, and so I also remember many years later when I began to teach him, like, here's, like, turn it around. Nails. <laughs> wood. And, and he was like, whoa, I can nail things into wood. And he began to experience the hammer, though he still uses it as a, as, as a digger, too. But I'm, I'm convinced that the way that most of Christians relate to the Old Testament and to the book of Job is a lot like that. We come with our some preloaded assumptions about what it is, what it's for, what you're supposed to do with it, and we find ways to make it work. But there's a double tragedy because we make it do things that maybe it wasn't actually designed to do, all the while missing out on the immense potential of what it actually is designed to do, but we don't have a clue what that thing is because we're perfectly happy digging holes with our hammer. Are you guys with me? So what I want to know is like, what is the book of Job actually trying to do? And what Jesus said it's about is something that I maybe, or maybe you have never thought to think that the book of Job is about. And I've come to the place where I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus is right. I don't know what else the book of Job could be about except what Jesus described in his summary. And so with the short amount of time that's left, that's what I want to talk about. You guys with me? Yeah. Okay. Um, first, sorry, one more thing. <laughs> um, because what the book of Job about is what the book of Job is about and what Jesus' summary is about is what the entire Hebrew Bible is about. It's actually not about very many things. And so in this way, and this is maybe another helpful illustration if the hammer doesn't work for you, um, is the Hebrew Bible is a lot, a lot like uh, Blue Note era American jazz. And anybody, next slide, next slide. Yeah, there we go, come on, okay. 
Um, so uh, blue, note, blue Note label? Anybody? Yeah, all right. So this is a jazz label. It started in the late 30s, but really came into its own um, in the late 50s and early 60s. And um, when, when very few uh, African-American jazz composers get, get signed to large uh, music labels, Blue Note just like created the most genius group of music composers, I think, in my humble opinion, uh, in American history, John Coltrane being one of them. And what is really um, one of the uh, trademarks of this era of modern jazz music was that the first 30 seconds of any song was given over to giving you the melody, just the core melody. And sometimes it would be just 30 seconds, sometimes 20 seconds. And then the rest of the song would just be cycling through the core melody. And, but never identically and never the same. Every time you walk through the melody, you explore it from another angle. You explore it with another instrument. And so uh, this is one of John Coltrane's most famous albums and his famous song, Blue Train. Anybody? I mean, if you heard it, you, you, you would know. The melody is very simple. da 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 there it is. The song is 11 minutes long. <laughs> it's 11 minutes long. And it's that but never like how I just sung it to you, right? <laughs> actually good. Uh, but uh, but the, you actually never fully hear the first statement identically ever again. It's just cycled, recycled, this time with the piano, this time with um, the bass, this time with the major chords turned minor, this time in harmony, this time at double tempo. And it's just every, and what, what this form of music is, it's a way of exploring just a few notes in one melody but exploring the infinite potential that's possible when you look at those set of notes from all the possible angles. The Hebrew Bible is just like this. And the book of Job is like a jazz quartet that's 11 hours into the session. And by the time you get to Job, you've cycled through the melody hundreds of times. And so when the hostile one steps onto the scene like, you know this character, You've actually encountered this character dozens of times before. And you know what he's going to say, and you know what he's all about. And when God introduces Job as his righteous, blameless servant, you're like, oh yeah, okay, I know exactly what's going to happen next. In other words, the book of Job is never meant, was never meant to stand alone. It's meant to be understood in light of what the entirety of the Hebrew Bible is about. And you've already been prepared, if you've been tracing the melody. So, here is my best attempt to show you the melody, and then we'll come back to the book of Job. You guys with me? How are you guys doing? Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, just like in jazz music, the first stories of Genesis give you the melody. And the melody goes like this. In the beginning, God created the skies and the land. Didn't see that coming, did you? <clears throat> so, God um, faces... The pre-creation disorder and chaos, he sends his wind and breath over the waters and he splits them so that dry land can emerge and God summons this garden of potential out of the land. And then he summons these creatures up out of the dirt of the land. And then among those creatures, there's a a particular one that's very special to God that is infused with divine breath and appointed as God's image and representative. And the whole setup is that through these human images of God, heaven and earth are bridged and connected. It's like God representing his rule and presence and authority here on earth through these portals of heaven and earth, images of God. Sounds like a great setup. Um, Except it all goes terribly, terribly wrong. Um, Because the goodness of this whole setup of blessing in life is dependent on whether humans are going to represent God's rule in the world by trusting God's wisdom to discern between good and bad. Humans decide 
uh, to define good and bad by their own wisdom, but not by themselves. Not by themselves. There's this mysterious snake in the garden, and it starts spinning a web of deceit and trying to get the humans to believe that God is holding out on them, that God is actually not quite as generous as you might assume, and that the thing that God is asking you to trust him about, it will actually go much, much better if you just do that thing yourself. And you could become your own God, is what the snake says to the human images. And so, of course, you know the story, um, through their own folly and falling prey to deception, uh, they're exiled from the garden into the land of dust and death. And so, we enter into the death and suffering part of the story. And what's really crucial in this way of retelling the story is that God, when God informs them of the consequences of their decision, it's God's lament. And when he tells the humans that they're going to return to the dust from which they came, he's saying that at the, at the moment that they forfeited the gift that he wanted to gift them, which is union with his own eternal life. And so the humans are thrust out into the land of dust and death from which they came. And so begin the cycles of violence. It begins with the next generation. Their son defines good and bad in his own eyes, and he murders his brother. And so this brother's blood soaks the ground. And that blood cries out from the ground, we're told. And that cry rises up to God. And then that brother, the murderer, seven generations go down his line, and it leads to one of his descendants, who becomes the founder of a city. And this is a city that glories in military prowess and violence. And even more blood begins to soak the ground until the cry of innocent blood from the ground, the cry becomes so strong that God cannot uh, take it anymore. And so what he decides is that these humans are going to destroy themselves, so I'll just accelerate the process. And those dark, chaotic waters that God parted, he allows them to collapse back in and wash creation clean of, a, of the blood of the innocent. But there is one righteous, blameless servant of God. His name is Noah. It means rest. Noah, rest. Um, no, let's go back. Let's go back. Yep. Thanks, Corin. So uh, this guy, this guy's awesome. God says to this guy, um, things are going to go really terrible. Um, the whole creation is about to collapse. And um, I'm going to ask you to do something that's really crazy to build this box. And this box is going to save your life and the life of your family because I've seen you as righteous in this generation. And so God delivers his righteous chosen one through the waters of death. And the boat lands on top of a mountain. And the first thing that Noah does when he gets off his box boat is to build an altar. And he offers a sacrifice, which in biblical imagery is a way of, of signaling your absolute surrender before God. And God looks on the total surrender of his righteous, blameless, chosen one. And what is God's response? It's remarkable. It's in Genesis chapter 8. I don't know if you've read it recently. But what God says is, you know what I know about humans? Um, they're no different. They're going to keep murdering and slaughtering each other. But because of what Noah has done... I'm going to forgive. And the thing that I did to wash creation clean and to decreate, I'm not going to do that again. And because of the righteous intercession of the suffering chosen one, God releases blessing and a new chance at creation again. Hooray! Noah saves the world! <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> Everything. Actually, everything. Everything can and does uh, go wrong because it's humans, humans that are involved. But there you go. Do you see the melody? It's right there. It's right there. Okay, one more cycle. So that guy Noah, um, the next thing he does after getting off his boat is plant a garden. Sweet. You know, taken after God, planting gardens. That's awesome. Uh, he plants a whole bunch of, you know, fr uh, fruit vines in, in the garden. That's great. And he consumes the fruit of that garden and he becomes naked. Yeah, and he goes into his tent, and his son, something terribly shameful and sexually abusive happens with his son in the tent. His son does something to him, or I think more likely to Noah's wife, and that results in the birth of a child. And that child, named Canaan, gives birth to a whole lineage that goes multiple generations, leading to the birth of this violent warrior king named Nimrod. His name means rebel in Hebrew. 
And uh, this guy loves to boast about his hunting accomplishments. He's an animal slayer. And he's the founder of your friendly empire and mine, Babylon, which is the archetypal evil empire in the biblical story. And what Babylon goes on to do is to create this monstrous city with a tower exalting the name and language and culture of Babylon, building it up to the skies, giving it the divine imprimatur that gives them, right, the legitimacy to conquer the world in the name of their God. Anybody know that story before? And so God sees this monstrosity of human arrogance, and so he decreates it. He scatters Babylon. And out of that scattering, however, he sees one guy, one guy named Avram, or Abraham, and his wife, Sarah. Avram means exalted father, and Sarah means queen. So he calls exalted father and queen out of Babylon, and they have to trek through this desolate wilderness to a land where they don't know where. And the first thing they do when they obey God's command and they go to this land is they go up to some mountains, and they build some altars. And they begin to call on the name of Yahweh. And Yahweh sees the absolute surrender of his righteous chosen one. And what does he do? He says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put into motion a plan to restore my blessing to all of the nations. Anybody? This is cycle two. Do you get it? Next slide. Just press repeat. Isaac and Jacob. Joseph and his brothers. Moses and the Israelites. The stories of Samuel or Ruth, David, Esther, and Daniel, they are all architected on the pattern of the melody. And the, it's really cool because the more times you cycle through the melody as you get further and further into the Hebrew scriptures, the way that later stories will pick up the vocab vocabulary and patterns of earlier ones, it just, it's like the jazz quartet. And by the time you get to the book of Job, you're just supposed to have it in your, in your blood. Right? And so, it, it, it truly, the book of Job is like a, a quartet of virtuoso players, and they're just working the melody. And you're just supposed to track. But most of us don't know how to track, which is why most of us have a very frustrating time with the book of Job. So, should we come back to the book of Job? Did you know that this was actually going to be about the whole Hebrew Bible tonight? <laughs> So let's just notice some things about the book of Job. First of all, when Job is introduced to us, do you remember what God calls him? He calls him my righteous, blameless servant. You want to know something that's really interesting? There's only three people who are called righteous and blameless in the whole story of the Hebrew Bible. Do you want to guess what their names are? Next slide. Noah, Abraham, and, and Job. Job. Job's up top, Noah in the middle, Abraham at the bottom. And so that's a good example where just those few words at the beginning of the book of Job are the author's way of queuing you up, queuing up your expectations. Dear reader, this is a new Noah. Dear reader, this is a new Abraham. Now here's the thing, is you're reading through the Hebrew Bible and you come to all these characters and like when Noah saves the world, right, or when Abraham saves the world, it's always followed by the next story of them doing something really terrible to the, themselves or to other people, or they die. And so every time you go through the cycle of the melody, you get a shape of the solution of God's plan, of how he's going to respond to this huge mess that humans have created. And God's plan is to do this, is to raise up a righteous intercessor who will stare into the abyss of human suffering and not run away, but head right into it, responding to God's call to charge into and involve themselves in the suffering and evil of the world and hold their integrity and trust and hope. And when God's righteous intercessor wades through suffering and death, emerging out the other side, God hears the cry of his righteous one and releases blessing and forgiveness. That's the melody. And you watch all of these characters do it, and then you come to the book of Job, and you're like, well, what's this guy going to do? Let's find out. So what does Job do? Well, he holds in his integrity for like two chapters, okay? Excuse me. He holds his temper for like two chapters, and the whole thing is about, is this guy going to hold his integrity or not? And so as all of the friends begin to accuse him, Job gets more and more impatient with them because he's just like, I, I don't know what to tell you guys. I didn't do anything to deserve this, and they can't believe that it's possibly true. And so it 
if you've ever read the book, you know at some point he just stops talking to them. He just ignores them like they don't exist anymore. And Job's uh, cry, Job's outcry, Job's, this long section of Job's yelling at God in the center of the book is the melodies, this cycle of the melodies version of the outcry of innocent blood rising up to God. It's Job's lament. And when God's righteous, chosen, favored one cries out to him day and night from a place of full integrity and purity, God listens. And so what's really interesting is that Job's prayer and laments become more and more singular throughout the book until they become focused in on just one request. And it's in chapters 29 through 31 of Job. And Job's only desire is to see God. If I could just see him face to face, just have one moment of encounter where we could have a moment of communion together and I could lay my case before him. I know he would hear me. I have to believe he would hear me. And that becomes Job's only request. And it's what he gets. And so when God shows up to Job and God responds to him, and I actually still feel pretty good about the explanation I gave about that in the video, and that's a whole rabbit hole. But after uh, um, God's response to Job, Job just has one last thing to say. He surrenders. He just says, I'm sorry. I accused you of wrongdoing. Uh, my ears have heard of you, but now I see you. I recant. I repent in dust and ashes. And the moment that God's righteous servant humbles himself after going through horrendous suffering, and this is really remarkable, the next thing in the story is this. And this was the other thing that like hit me like a ton of bricks when I was riding my bike in the 20s of Southeast Salmon to work one day where I was like, oh my gosh, no way. Look at what happens next in the story. I think next slide. This is Job uh, chapter 42. After the Lord said these things to Job, he, that is the Lord, said to Eliphaz, this is one of Job's friends, the Temanite, dude, I'm so angry at you. You and your two friends because you haven't spoken the truth about me. You wrapped me in your theological formulas. You, you love to talk about me. You love to talk about me. But you haven't spoken the truth about me like Job has. Job is the only character in the book who talks to God. Job is the one who actually utters what you would say could be the most possibly heretical statements about God in the book. And God's not like angry about that at all. What he says is, here's somebody who knows how to tell the truth. Are you with me? And Job's the only person in the book who poured all of his despair, all of his anger, all of his confusion before God, and talks to God and comes to a place of trust and surrender. And watch what happens the moment that Job reaches that place. Verse 8, so now, Eliphaz, um, go take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and sacrifice a burnt offering for yourselves. You know, my servant Job is going to pray for you and I will accept his prayer. I won't deal with you according to your folly because you didn't tell the truth about me. You know, Job has. So Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and so far the Naamathite. I don't know why it's funny to say their names. They did what the Lord told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer, and then he's restored. Notice that Job is still suffering when he utters his prayer. When God's righteous servant is willing to surrender everything and go into suffering that is unjust and undeserved, and cry out on behalf of the many before God. God hears the prayer of his righteous servant and forgiveness is released to the nations. Notice that all of the nations that his three friends are from are highlighted right at that moment in the story. Are you guys with me? So the, the book of Job is not designed to answer our questions about the problem of evil. The book of Job is designed to do what the whole of the Hebrew Bible is designed to do, which is not to give us an answer an intellectual answer that we can tuck in our pockets and walk away feeling good about the world. Because we shouldn't be feeling good about the world. We live outside of Eden, you guys. It sucks out here. We're dying. You're dying. Do you know that? 
I'm dying. It's terrible, actually. It's not okay what happens out here. And, you know, all the ways that we anesthetize ourselves, you know, <laughs> with our devices and creature comforts, and it's just... Uh, the book of Job is trying to shake us awake. The world's not okay. But man, what if, what if, here outside of Eden, we had somebody who would stare down the worst of human pain and suffering and maintain their integrity and surrender their lives before God? Man, what if, what if someone like that came along? The last sentence of the book of Job is that he dies. And you're like, okay, well, I thought it was going to be him. But <laughs> right? if anybody was going to do it, it would be the book of Job. And, and the melody continues. Are you tracking with me? When Jesus talked about the book of Job, he wasn't just talking about an interesting set of stories about the past. And he wasn't just summarizing like, hey, isn't this cool, this thing I just did over you know, Passover weekend here in Jerusalem. It just happens to match one or two prophecies in the Old Testament. What he's saying is that the whole thing's about him. Like the whole thing is about him. Job is Jesus. Are you tracking with me? And, and what I mean when I say that is Job is one among the whole mosaic of characters in the Hebrew Bible that is trying to tell us what's wrong with the world, about what's wrong with us, about the kind of place that we're living in, and what is the, what's the way out here? And every cycle of the melody just keeps focusing in on one, one solution. Man, if we just had one human who actually didn't listen to the snake, who actually didn't give in to the desires and the creature comforts that get us all to compromise and redefine good and evil in, by our own wisdom and in our own eyes, man, what if someone like that came along? And it's like, it's like the Hebrew Bible gives you the silhouette and Jesus of Nazareth just walks right into it. That's what he's saying. And so this summary right here, it doesn't just summarize the book of Job. It's actually the life of Jesus. And this is the next slide. And I'll end with this. Just think through the story of Jesus with me. All four of the Gospels present Jesus to us as God's chosen, favored, anointed one, his righteous and blameless one. At Jesus' baptism, Jesus is marked as God's blameless, chosen Messiah. What's the very next thing that happens in all of the gospel accounts? Jesus is led into the wilderness. By whom? Who takes Jesus into the wilderness where he begins to suffer? The Spirit. And what's really interesting is that when the Spirit brings Jesus on purpose into a period of suffering, we're like, yeah, go Jesus. <laughs> like, do it on my behalf, please. But when God brings Job into suffering on behalf of his arrogant friends so that his prayer can cover for their sins, we're like, that's not fair. Are you with me? But it's the same thing. It's the same thing. When Jesus goes into the wilderness and he suffers, unjustly, and he begins this journey of shouldering and carrying all of the suffering and the failure and the compromise of all of the history of the train wreck of human history outside of Eden. And he begins to shoulder it, and he begins to redefine what it's going to be to, to crush the snake. And it's not going to be by beating him at its own game, it's going to be by giving up power and surrendering power. And Jesus emerges victorious from that wilderness and he begins to encounter all of these hurting people. And notice, uh, Jesus gets angry a number of times in uh, the gospel accounts about him. And at, at every moment, like when a man with skin disease comes up to him, this is in Mark's account of Jesus meeting the, the leper. And Mark tells us that Jesus got really angry. Like, who is he angry at? I'm really certain it's not God. I'm really certain it's not God. How did Jesus reach a place where he could see people suffering in a way that was so unjust and so tragic, and he did not question the character of God? Do you know who it made him angry at? It made him angry at that snake. Jesus described his healing ministry as breaking into the house of a highway bandit 
that had robbed all of this plunder from people, and he's here to get back what belongs to God. Are you with me? When Jesus saw that woman, this is in the Gospel of Luke, and her, she, her back was malformed and she had been bent over for 18 years, and what he said is, man, this woman has been enslaved to the snake for 18 years. It ends today. When Jesus saw his suffering world, the one that he was angry at was that hostile one who's responsible in all of the roads of cause and effect of human evil and suffering within the biblical story all lead back to the moment that humans believe the lie. And we've been believing the lie ever since. And that's the one that Jesus is angry at. And so when we read the book of Job, the, the one that all of our frustration and angst and anger ought to be directed at is Hasatan. Are you with me? And, and God, in his mysterious purpose and, and, and mercy, has raised up a righteous servant who will go into suffering and emerge victorious out the other side. And that's exactly the story of Jesus. That's the story that Jesus saw himself fulfilling. And so the, the story of Jesus, the Hebrew Bible, the book of Job, it doesn't give us an answer to the things that we wish the, the Bible would speak to, which is why. But what it does tell us is what God is doing about human suffering. And it's not an answer that you can put in your pocket because God's response was a, per a person. God's love become human to become the righteous intercessor that you and I all could be, but we just perpetually fail to be. And Lord, have mercy upon us. And he has that he has sent the one righteous intercessor who is the greater than Noah, the greater than Abraham, and the greater than Job. And so for my journey with the book of Job at this point is my life is I want Job to become my brother and my teacher, to teach me how to lament, to teach me how to become intolerant towards the tragic evil and suffering, and to take my confusion and my despair and my anger, and to pour it all out before God, trusting, trusting that the suffering and the victory of Jesus over death is the solution to the riddle in ways that I can't comp possibly comprehend. And it's not, and I'll close with this, it's not a kind of a solution that you can just like walk away from. Like we're a community of apprentices to Jesus and what that means, at least I think what it means, is that this melody, like it, Jesus was the crescendo of all the notes of the melody, but like the song didn't stop with him, like, like it's still going. And so what it means to be a Christian, that is a, a Messiah person, is to, to allow my life to become another cycle of the melody. Not because I think I can save the world, but because I'm pretty sure I'm connected to the one who did. Uh, and the only way I know how to allow him to save me is to take on the melody in my own life story. And so what it, all of a sudden the book of Job can become like our coach and our mentor for what it's going to mean for each one of us to stare into the suffering that is certain for each one of us. And if it hasn't crashed into your life yet, it will. And who are you going to be angry at? And I want to be angry at the right person, <laughs> if you could even call the hostile one a person. And what I want to be angry at is not God. What I want to do is to imitate the patience and the suffering and the laments of Job. And so my hope for all of us is that we can become a community that learns how to lament and how to model our righteous intercession based on the righteous intercession of the ultimate righteous servant of God. May God have mercy on us, and may it be so. Thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed that. We've got some bonus content now. I also discovered the question and answer. Uh, Tim sitting down with his pastor, Tyler Statton and uh, going over this sermon. And these questions really, really help bring it all home and put it all into context. So enjoy. And also, don't forget to subscribe. It really helps. Check it out. Well, Tim, 
It is so fun to get to do this together, man. Yep. Um, you, you mentioned the word uh, keys in, in your teaching. You, know, you said, like, this is one of the keys to mm. understanding. Mm. Um, and I once heard the scripture described as a mansion where all the doors are locked, <laughs> but the keys are in the books that unlock the other doors. And so as you understand one book of the scripture, it actually unlocks <laughs> understanding of another book <laughs> of scripture. <laughs> and I heard that again as you were talking about the melody. <laughs> um, so thank you for unlocking <laughs> some of this for us. And now we're going to jump into some questions, and, and we're going to allow everyone here to do some interaction. So let's start here. Is the book of Job an allegory, or is it historical? Is this a piece of poetry that shows us something abstractly about Jesus, or is this a real guy that this really happened to? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, maybe this is probably, you know, pedantic, but, uh, you know, the, it is poetry, the center part. It's dense Hebrew poetry from chapter 3 to um, 40, um, but then with narrative, uh, prologue, and epilogue. So um, uh, followers of Jesus who believe that the scriptures are a gift from the spirit and the human authors believe Jesus rose from the dead differ on this question. So let's, um, you know, l let's just register like this isn't a litmus test for whether or not you love Jesus, right? Um, and it's an important, it's an important question. So uh, w one, Job is mentioned one other time in the Hebrew Bible, um, and then he's mentioned in the New Testament. In the Hebrew Bible, it's the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, who mentions Job. It's in Ezekiel chapter 14. And uh, what he mentions Job among the most righteous, blameless people you could ever imagine. And he lists Job alongside Noah and Daniel, uh, who are all th three of the most flawless characters in the Hebrew Bible, well, except the thing that Noah did at the end. So um, it's clear, I think that it's clear evidence that Job was a, was a non-Israelite, of what, in, whose story was widely known and whose life story as like a righteous, blameless individual. Um, so the question is, uh, did this book, am I being asked by the biblical authors to assume that there's some sort of oral tradition about Job's story that got passed down and that some like ancient like video recorder or something of like these long poetic dialogues you know, that this represents what these people actually said. And I, to me, that just presses the, the bounds of reasonableness. Um, I think it's most, and this is just my take, people would differ, I think it's most likely that it's a wisdom thought experiment about a known, a culturally known, uber-righteous figure in their culture and time. And that uh, the, what the biblical authors are doing is they're taking all of the core vocabulary and themes of the melody of the whole scriptural collection, and then they're working a cycle through the melody, but putting as a main character an actual historical figure uh, in Israel's memory. Um, I think that's the most likely explanation, and um, I think the biblical authors are giving lots of clues throughout that that's how they want readers to uh, take the book. Yeah, that's really helpful, and I think it uh, might help us lean naturally into another one of the questions we've received, which is, what are we to make of God's permission to the mm. Satan mm -hmm. to afflict Job? How, how does that fit into the melody, as you were yeah. phrasing? Yeah, yeah, so uh, if, I, if I wasn't clear on this, that would give me a, maybe a chance to be more clear. Um, the challenge that happens inside of us when we see God hand over his righteous servant to unjust suffering is the same challenge that we ought to have when God hands over his beloved son to suffering and death. It's the same thing happening. Um, and so the fact that we don't get as, well, maybe you do get triggered when God hands over Jesus to suffering. But um, when I come to these moments with Job or even in the story of Jesus, and what all of the closest followers of Jesus saw revealed in the God of Job and in the God who handed Jesus over to death 
was the, an, a revelation of the love of God. God is proud of Job. He's confident in Job, and he knows that Job will pass the test. That's why he allows him to undergo it. And that's exactly the same point of the melody that Jesus is playing out. God, the Father trusts the Son, has entrusted everything over to the Son, and knows that He's the only one who can be for the humans what the humans have failed to be for themselves. And so, um, I guess that's, for, for me, it's both forward illumination from Job to help understand what's happening in the story of Jesus, but then it's back illumination from the story of Jesus that helps me understand what God is doing with Job. What I don't think it's teaching us is, you know, sometimes if God wakes up on the wrong side of the bed, he might just like, you know, put a landmine in your way to test you, you know. Um, that, I think that's us making the book of Job answer a set of questions that we have that's really different than what Jesus said the Bible is designed to communicate. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it completely makes sense. And I also heard you saying uh, a number of times, you know, that the, the way that we read this book, the question that we should be bringing to it is mm. not, how mm. do we square the problem of evil? Mm -hmm. But the question that we should be bringing to it is, how do I respond to injustice mm. as mm. Jesus responds to injustice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this book is giving us a kind of a shadow or a glimpse mm -hmm. or maybe another angle at the melody yeah. uh, yep. toward that question. Yeah, yeah. The biblical story is telling us what God is doing about evil and suffering in the world, culminating the story of Jesus, which becomes ideally the model and the pattern of my life as an apprentice of Jesus. And that's what the book of Job is for. That's what the hammer's for. And you can make the book of Job answer other questions, but we ought to know that we're likely going to misuse it in the process, and we should be very, very tentative uh, when we're making the book of Job try and answer things it really wasn't designed to do. Yeah. Yeah. But that's true of all, all of Scripture, I think. Yeah. So, um, do you think that the courtroom structure of the heavenly realm that is portrayed in Job mm. and uh, portrayed graphically in that video that we just saw. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, and it shows up elsewhere in the Bible. Is that merely an idea from culture or is it, uh, or of the biblical writers, or mm. is that a reflection of, of true reality of what the heavenly realms are like? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exa that's exactly right. That is exactly the question. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, the divine court uh, scene uh, uh, appears in all, all different parts of the Bible, in, in the Torah, in the prophets, in the Psalms, um, in Job, um, and it appears uh, in the New Testament as well. Um, in John the visionary in the Revelation, um, John sees the heavenly throne room and with the creatures and so on. So here's something that's really interesting, is that all of the imagery in all of those different passages uh, has strong parallels to depictions of um, the divine realm in the cultures of Israel's neighbors, of uh, divine court rooms, of divine courtiers or spiritual beings um, that look very similar to what the cherubim are described as looking at. Actually, if you, you could just Google, like, um, you know, the modern, in modern day Iraq, they have this you know, this big build out of how they restored a part of ancient Babylon. And these guardian creatures um, that the kings of Babylon placed at the gates were these multiform animal winged creatures with human faces and so on. They're really, they're called the Lamassu statues. They're really cool looking. And they're like, they look almost exactly like what cherubim looked like as they're described in the Bible. So this is interesting, is that the biblical authors used the imaginative framework that they had and when they encountered the divine realm, that's what they saw and experienced. And that used to bother me, um, and I guess it, maybe it still does a little bit. Um, but one other thing that became really noticeable to me was that every time that this divine court is described in all of these different visions and scenes throughout Scripture, Old and New Testaments, it's always a little bit different. The creatures look different. Sometimes they have two wings. Sometimes they have four. Sometimes they have six. 
Sometimes they're glowing. Sometimes they're on fire. Sometimes they're smoking. Uh, and, and so, like, it's, I think what, um, what we're up against here is the fact that God has chosen to communicate through humans. Like, the scriptures are the products of people. Um, and the Bible is, like, not bashful about this fact. It actually tells us about the writing of many of the scrolls by people in the, in the books themselves. And so, um, in, in a way, the question is, is similar to the fact is, does God speak Aramaic? Well, Jesus of Nazareth spoke Aramaic. Does that mean that God speaks Aramaic? Well, no, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Are you with me? It's actually just a different version of the same question. Every time that God is going to interface with humans, it's going to be in the form of human language, imagination, and cultural expression. And what that doesn't mean is that Isaiah or John, the visionary, didn't actually encounter something. But the thing that he encountered was interpreted by his brain, given the cultural and imaginative framework that, that he had. And the same is, is true for me. And that doesn't mean it's not real. If anything, what we're trying to say is whatever the presence of God is, it's more real than anything you could ever imagine. It, and it can only be captured in human words and imagination, given the fact that, you know, I'm not God, and so I'm going to describe it with the language and categories that I have. I'm sorry, this is a really big question. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but to me, uh, the, uh, the divine court scenes in the Bible raised this question for me a long, long, long time ago, and so I care about it. And I think it's an important one because it really forces us to reckon with the nature of the Bible as a product of both divine and human initiatives partnered together. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm tracking with you. I, I'm, I'm contemplating. This is what I'm contemplating. Often, you and I eat food together, and you talk about the Bible, and I happen to also really really like the Bible. <laughs> and, and so there's like connections firing off yeah. in my head while you're talking yeah. that, that I'm excited to ask you about. And that's happening right now. And I'm like, <laughs> there's a lot of people in here for me just to be doing that thing that we do over food. Yeah, totally. But that being said, so this past Sunday we looked at Luke 18 and the story of the persistent widow. Yes, yeah which happens to take place in a courtroom. Mm. And you were talking about like the, like the blood of the innocents crying out yes. for yes. justice. Yes. And the end of that story is, and will not God give justice to his chosen ones mm. who cry out to him day and night? So might Jesus be giving us a mini picture of the same melody that mm. we see played out in Job in mm. that story? Mm where he borrows the courtroom imagery and everything. Mm. Is, is there a connection there? Yes. Mm. <laughs> we like really we... should have talked before my last sermon. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you six years ago. <laughs> yeah. No, did the outcry, man, the outcry of... Uh, the innocent, it happens in so many powerful ways. The one that I was um, meditating on today um, is in the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. Um, and this is where Abraham and Sarah abuse, sexually abuse their Egyptian slave to produce a son, which then gets discarded a few chapters later. Um, and, um, you know, a longstanding puzzle in the story of Abraham is why God asks that Abraham give up the firstborn son that Sarah and Abraham actually do produce, uh, with asking for uh, the life of Isaac, right? Sacrifice on Mount Moriah. How's that story fit into your view of God, right? And so, um, actually, I think it ought to play a really important role in our view of God. But um, that's the next event. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, there's this law in Exodus that cyc and it's cycling through the unjust the suffering and the cry of the innocent. And um, that Hagar's name is the Hebrew word for the immigrant. Hagar is the Hebrew word, the immigrant. 
And so there's this law in Exodus 22 about how Israel is to never oppress the immigrant in their midst because you were oppressed in Egypt. And then God says, if, if an immigrant is oppressed within Israel, I will hear their cry and it will reach my ears and I will turn your, that is Israel's parents into or I will uh, turn you, Israel's parents, uh, Israel's children into orphans. I'm going to kill you. If you oppress um, me, I'm going to decreate you. And so I think that law and the story of what Abraham and I, uh, Sarah do to uh, the immigrant, I mean, God's really, really angry about what Abraham and Sarah did to the immigrant in their midst. And it unleashes this horrific chain of suffering in division in the family of Abraham. And it's all about the outcry of the innocent because what does Hagar do when she's oppressed by God's chosen one? The irony there is it's God's chosen ones who are the ones doing the oppressing in that story. And the immigrant goes out to the wilderness and she cries out to God. And God hears her cry and delivers her and then brings a severe act of judgment on his chosen one but then delivers him in the last second. And so these themes, it's not just like here or there. It's like every story is cycling through the melody. And so Jesus will hit it in a parable. The Abraham stories will hit it here. Allah and Exodus will hit it there. It's, it's everywhere. There's that bit, that famous bit in the book of Job, um, where uh, he says God gives and takes away, right? So how are we? that does that mean that god has some sort of role in causing suffering mm. mm -hmm. uh, he certainly thinks that at that point in the story um, i think and this is for, uh, for me uh, what i need to work on more in job is about the progression of his character i mean when job says that it's chapter two <laughs> it's the beginning and I'm pretty sure anybody who's good at developing a character in the story wants you to take the whole port take away the whole portrait not just like the first thing the character said in the first scene and so um, when Job says that he's also going to say a lot of other things that's going to accuse God um, of being responsible for all of the suffering in the world and so I think there's something about how we evaluate Job's words in light of the prologue and the epilogue. And um, I think that's something, just to be perfectly honest, I need to process a lot, a lot more. It, it, Job is definitely giving voice to something that is a major theme in the story, which is when God selects a chosen one on behalf of the many so that through them his blessing can go out to the many, that often leads to suffering and hardship for that chosen one. Um, and it's a part of God's journey with his chosen one. And I think Job is giving voice to that. And he's not angry about it. Um, and it doesn't seem to me that Jesus was angry about it when he was in the wilderness either. Um, so there's some aversion. I could even sense it in myself right now where um, I want to somehow protect God's reputation from ever dealing severely <laughs> with, with people. And uh, that's something I just continually have to surrender. If I'm ever going to hope to understand these texts on their own terms and not remake them in my, my, my own image, I know this is an area where I really need to just sit and listen more to Scripture. And my hunch is I'm probably not the only one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, speaking of the progression of Job's character, um, Job... Go, we, we watch him go through this process of trusting God for a time and then just not being able to take it anymore. And, and then re-finding himself in that surrender to the wisdom of God. So what, if anything, can we take away from the book of Job in terms of finding ourselves in the story? And how wa might we mm. walk a similar path mm. when suffering comes knocking at our door mm. and disillusionment settles in after a time mm -hmm. to begin to rebuild trust and mm. find surrender again? Yep. Um, yeah, that's a really important question. Uh, I'm not sure I'm adequate to the task 
of giving it the answer it deserves. Um, but here is uh, what occurs to me in the moment. Um, the book of Job doesn't, it, the book of Job's session through the melody um, doesn't foreground and highlight the hostile one's role uh, in the suffering of all of creation. There's other cycles of the melody that really focus on that. And Job is really focused on the internal processing of God's righteous servant uh, as he goes through suffering to intercede for the many. But if we take the whole cycle of the biblical story, um, and this is what I was trying to get at, um, I think the one that Jesus was angry at was not God. It was that freaking snake. That snake. That's the one that Jesus was angry at. And so if I'm going to adopt Jesus' view of why the world is the way that it is, it means recognizing that we live outside of Eden. And outside of Eden, we are all destined for the dust of death and for suffering. In this world, you will have trouble. And please don't expect anything else, I think is what Jesus is trying to say. Except, you, except we get these moments, these, these little gifts of Eden in the form of a friendship, in the form of a good meal, in the form of laughter with a friend, in the form of a gift of healing, in the form of ways that God speaks to us. Through, are you guys with me? Yeah. These little Eden gifts that we get outside of Eden in, in the wilderness. <clears throat> and it seems to me that Jesus really saw the suffering and evil in his world as a result of this huge cascade of cause and effect all leading back to the lies of the snake. And I have to imagine that that, based on his words and his teachings, that that's what he believed and that that's what carried him through the wilderness, through all of those nights in agony and prayer, knowing that the priests were, were, had a plan to murder him. I mean, just imagine trying to sleep through the night knowing that there's someone who wants to murder you. Like, I've never had that experience. And Jesus walked around with that. That was his daily lived experience for like a long time. Like, what carried him through? And I'm just certain it wasn't a suspicion of God's character. I am, I am certain that it was a, a, a hatred for the snake. And knowing that he was doing exactly what God was calling him to do. Um, to overcome the snake. Uh, through his death and resurrection. And so what, what does it mean for us to process that? I want to come to a place where the suffering that happens to my life and that happens to the people that I love and that's happening, you know, I mean, the stuff that you came out, you know, this week about what's happened in Ukraine over the last few weeks and all these civilian deaths, right? And we're all like shocked that this is how humans treat each other. And man, the longer I sit with the Hebrew Bible and it's like, this, like, why would I expect anything different? Like, this is what humans always do to each other. And if, if I happen to think that this is not how humans treat each other, it's because I'm the delusional one, right? And, and this is what happens every day in every human community, through all of human history, across the whole planet. In this world, you will have trouble. I shouldn't expect anything else. And it's not God's fault. If I'm taking up the mind of Jesus, I think, it's the snake's fault. And what God is doing is doing something through uh, Jesus and the work of his spirit to reunite heaven and earth. And it, I'm sorry, what I, well, I'm not sorry, but what I'm, trying to, what I'm trying to say, and this is my nerdy way of doing it, but it's just who I am, it's just my temperament. But I'm really, I'm thinking personally and pastorally. When, sh when suffering crashes into our lives, we go to these default modes of processing our life experience. And they're not the modes that you consciously think about. They're the ones that are deeply ingrained within us. And so it seems to me what apprenticeship to Jesus means is somehow beginning a set of habits and practices in my life that, where, I, where that new narrative that is Jesus' story becomes my like, new second native language for how I process suffering in my life. And I want to get to a place where when suffering happens to my life and the people that I care about, where I'm not suspicious of God, 
but I, God becomes the only place that I know to go. And where my anger is directed is at that freaking snake. Are you with me? I want to get to that place. I'm not there. And I don't fully know why I'm not there. But all I can say is that I've been formed by other stories about suffering and why the world is the way that it is that are not how Jesus would tell the story. And I don't want to tell the story that way anymore. Are you with me? And um, so I don't know if... Well, I think that was a response to the question. But that's how I responded. Yeah, I also think it was a response. And, you know, w what I'm thinking about is, is you know, in, in the garden... Adam and Eve don't go to God after the deception of the serpent, yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. In the book of Job, God is upset with the friends because they're talking a lot about him, trying to make sense of this puzzle. Yeah. Only Job is going to him, even though, as you pointed out, Job might be the heretic among them, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and God is pleased with Job. Yes. I think one of the most maybe practical things that we can do when suffering comes into our lives is to go to Jesus. You know, the, the resurrected Jesus shows up again and again and again to people who thought they knew and understood God until he went to a cross and died. And then God did something that they didn't recognize. God did the kindest and greatest thing that they didn't recognize. And then Jesus shows up again to his followers in resurrected form, and they can't recognize him. And Jesus so lovingly poses questions where he draws out their deep need, their deep questions that, you know, woman, why are you weeping? Peter, do you love me more than these? It's, it's what are you talking about as you're walking together along the road, right? It's questions that draws those other stories up to the surface. Mm. And then Jesus talks about those things with them, and somewhere along the way in those conversations, they recognize him again. Mm. Mm. And so I would just say, if, if you find yourself trying to rebuild trust with God by listening to Tim Mackey talk about God, you're not going to get there. Mm. You've got to take the fight to God. And you have to discover what is discovered again and again on the pages of Scripture, and that is that only Jesus can heal you. But He's so eager to heal you. And when you recognize Him again, you will be utterly undone by His goodness, somehow at an even greater level than you were before the unjust suffering entered your life in the first place. And I don't know how to explain that except the attempt that, that is made in Romans of even what the enemy intends for evil, somehow he uses it for good. One more question. Um, sorry, I'm choosing. What does it look like Let's do this one. I changed my mind. <laughs> oh, we're going back to the heavenly courtroom. Okay. Sweet. Okay. I love it. Yeah. Uh, is Satan in God's counsel? How does he gain access mm -hmm. to the courtroom? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. That's a great. That's a great question. You can see why it was hard for me to choose. I mean, this is <laughs> it's quite a pivot. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, the, the, core, um, the core statement of the melody that happens in those early chapters of Genesis um, work like this. Actually, this is perfect. How much time do we have? Is that, is that the right clock right there? That's the right clock. Okay, it sweet. looks to me like you have six minutes okay. and 17 All right. seconds. Okay. All right. Um, so when but you I haven't taken math since I was 16. <laughs> <laughs> I studied the Bible like you. <laughs> um, I thought about doing the whole talk about this and then ended up in like this scrapyard of my notes. Um, but this is actually another biblical part of the melody that's been hugely helpful for me in trying to live in a new narrative when it comes to evil and suffering. 
In the opening, there's, there's two narratives that begin the Bible. Um, there's the seven-day creation narrative, and then there's the one-day creation narrative. And, you know, the fact that they work on different timelines and people have all kinds of different ways of working out the differences between them. The first narrative begins with a description of the pre-creation state, which doesn't really fit our modern ways of talking about the origins of the universe, but it made perfect sense to the biblical authors in their cultural context. And the pre-creation state is described as formless and void, or in, in Hebrew, uh, tohu vavohu, uh, wild and waste, a, a, a desolate wilderness. And then the second line in Genesis 1 verse 2 is a, a scene of darkness over the face of deep, abysmal waters. So a desert which are typically characterized by the absence of water. <laughs> and then in the next line, darkness over way too much water. Um, are you with me? And it's two images that just sit there that seem in tension on the surface level, but they're two ways of talking about the same reality, which is the biblical author's way of talking about non-existence, disorder and chaos. And so the rest of the seven-day narrative takes up that second image of the dark chaos waters, and then it's about God splitting the waters and parting them. The second narrative, uh, which begins in Genesis 2 verse 4, takes up that image of the will, trust me, this is all an answer to the question, um, uh, takes up the narrative and it begins creation over again, but telling the story of creation beginning with a desolate wilderness, Genesis 2 verse 4. And man, nothing can grow there, and there's no humans, and there's no farming, and there's no rain, Game over. It's like a non-starter. Um, but just like God's breath entered the darkness and began separating, so in this story, God provides water that turns that dirt into mud and the clay, and then he forms the human and he brings his breath to it, and you get humans. Okay. So what's interesting um, is in both of those stories, the depictions of chaos and disorder in the pre-creation state are that of a desolate wilderness and that of uh, darkness and chaos waters. And then as you get on into the rest of the biblical story, those become primary images to talk about how creation, when it's handed over to human evil and folly, we're either constantly reducing creation back into a form of chaotic flood or desolation and wilderness. And so when Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden, they go from the garden back into the wilderness where they, where they die. Uh, or uh, the, like the flood, you know, like God creates out of the waters and then um, he decreates by letting the waters come back over creation. And so desolate wilderness and dark chaotic waters are the primary images of death, disorder, and chaos. And so for a long time, when I was introduced to what the story of Christianity and the Bible is all about. It was a way of telling the story of the Bible that went like this. Everything was created to be perfect. Humans give in to sin, sin and death, and make it all bad and terrible. And through Jesus, everything is going to be perfect again one day. You guys tracking with me? Yeah. It's a very common way of retelling the story. Um, the problem with that retelling of the story is the Bible. <laughs> um, because that's not how the story begins. It doesn't begin perfect. It begins with darkness and disorder and chaos. And out of that state of chaos, God doesn't make something that's perfect. He makes something that is seven times over called, in Genesis 1, it's called good. And I'm pretty sure good doesn't mean perfect. <laughs> good means good, yeah? But perfect means complete. And so the way the biblical authors tell the story is God brought order and goodness out of chaos. But then when he puts the human in the garden, in proximity to his own life, um, what that is is an opportunity for good to become complete. And that is an opportunity that is forfeited and never realized in the biblical story because they they right? They make this, the dumb choice, and they go where? They go out into the wilderness, and then it ends up in a flood again. Are you with me? So in, in other words, um, the resolution to the biblical story, Jesus comes onto the scene not to restore a perfection that was lost, 
but it's actually to reclaim a future and a destiny that has never been experienced by any human before. Are you tracking with me? And so, um, sorry, what I'm talking about is the overall, how we imagine the story that, that we're living in. So I think within Jesus' imagination, when he encounters suffering and pain, it's not, well, we live in a world that fell from perfection and God's trapped us here. We're, we're all suffering. And man, if he was just nicer to us, he would like let us at least, you know, give us some air and give us some, right? I mean, the, the, this story tends toward a portrait of God that he kicked us out of the good place and he's keeping us down here and we're suffering. And if he was nicer to us, he might like give us some relief. And that's not how the biblical story works. The biblical story works is that we live in a good world, but man, it is not complete. And the problem is that we keep, through our own folly and believing the lies of that snake, keep giving ourselves and our communities and creation over to chaos and disorder. Are you tracking with me? And so the death and the suffering that, that's in our world within that frame of the biblical story is exactly what you would, it's the natural course of all creation. If, if God doesn't create, it's just the way things are, desolate and, and wilderness. And so um, I think I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around that way of telling the story. And if that wasn't very clear, it's because I'm still trying to find a way to articulate it. Uh, am I making any sense at all? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're with you. Yeah, totally. But th I think the point is that within that way of telling the biblical story, which I think is actually the way it's trying to present itself to us, suffering and death is about God's good creation being dragged back into a state of disorder and chaos. And um, what Jesus is, is doing is rescuing people from the chaos and opening up a way to the reunion of heaven and earth and to com completion once again. And it's just another way that begins, helps us begin to imagine evil and suffering within a different kind of story. Um, I've, I don't feel like I did a very good job of explaining that just now. So I apologize. And um, my hope is to make a Bible Project video about that. <laughs> 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 so so uh, hopefully one day it will be a lot more clear.